Yeah, almost everybody. And yeah, okay. How about you? Does anybody want wants to tell anything about your strange situation at home? Here it, here it is very strange, I guess. But probably there are places which are even more strange but, than my neighborhood, which I cannot recognize even these days. Mm. Well, uh, I'm in Germany now, uh, and I can tell you that people here are, are quite relaxed about the situation. I'm in Stuttgart, and uh, well, I have the feeling when I go and buy myself some food that, uh, well, it's a, sort of like a vacation feeling, sort of. I mean, people keep distance from each other, but except that nobody is having a face mask, nothing, nothing like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I had a short walk just just before, and I also saw people playing football. So I don't yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, exactly the stuff like way that. you should have, behave. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I guess people are a little bit bored. These were mostly young people, so maybe they don't have school or university, so they have a lot of free time. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's something to help. Um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, here to help you guys if you need anything. Um, so yeah, it'll just be good to see what we uh, get going to going with today. Wonderful. Um, anybody wants to present present themselves? Uh, yes, I would like to present myself. My name is Vincent. Uh, I am French. I live in Taiwan. And uh, Taiwan does not have a big issue with uh, the coronavirus right now because uh, the government took uh, early steps to uh, make sure that uh, every case uh, is monitored. And uh, the government has been trying a lot to uh, find each time the source of the virus. And so far, they are uh, in a good shape in the race. Uh, most of the new cases in Taiwan um, appear you know, Taiwan is an island, so there is a easy control on the uh, who is coming and who is going out. And uh, so far, uh, they, they put everybody who arrive in the country in quarantine uh, for 40 days. And uh, 14, it works very well. Uh, I am more worried about uh, the situation in Europe because uh, my family and friends who are in France uh, some of them, they do not take this, the problem seriously. Uh, they have no experience in the past with uh, something like SARS. Uh, and uh, I worry that uh, many of uh, the French people uh, do not realize how important it is to uh, stay uh, uh, in a confined environment. So I would like to... Um, uh, uh, I know how to program enclosures since a few years. I do it uh, during my free time, and uh, I'm not familiar with uh, data visual visualization tools. I hope to get familiar with them and do a little uh, homework, which is to draw a graph and predict what will be the result of the uh, outbreak in France in two weeks, and uh, maintain this prediction live so that people uh, can guess what is the percentage of what, what is the chance that they have that, that they have the virus and uh, maybe hopefully it will stop them from visiting their parents because i saw that happening many times people flee from where they are to see their parents and they risk to contaminate them so that's my goal for uh, today thank you so much um anybody I could say a word as well. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is uh, Theodore. I like closure. My way into closure and data science was through civil engineering. So I have some experience uh, on how to uh, do calculations about risk. And it kind of worries me that we don't treat this as seriously as we, as we should do. Um, I live in Norway, and I feel like the Norwegian state has got a decent handle on this. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I'm really curious about what 
kind of opportunity this is for for us as a community because I think we have something special to contribute and I don't know whether this is me uh, attributing closure and smartness and collecting all the things together because I like them um, but I think we have an advantage I don't know whether we know what the advantage is yet but I'm, I'm curious to see us see us use that one thanks yeah thank you mm. So, a couple of more people would like to say, yeah. Hey, everybody. Hello. Uh, my name is Jack, and uh, I have been programming Clojure professionally for 11 years, and programming Lisp and other functional languages for around 35 years, uh, and also have been doing things that people would now call data science for about the same amount of time, and I'm here to help. Oh, Jack, I, maybe you muted yourself by mistake. Mm. Oh, yeah, just for Can you the hear last. Me now? Could you hear me before or? Uh, just uh, for two sentences. So we yes. missed. That. I think it might have been a network problem then, because I, I only muted at the end when I stopped I think talking. It's it's hard to run uh, Zoom through Emacs, isn't it, Jack? Isn't it? It, it is. I had to write a special mode. Yeah, so. I it might still be buggy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what I was saying was that I'm just here to help. If anyone needs any help, that's what I'm here for. Um, so, actually, um, about using closure for. Um, for so to say a real purpose yesterday evening a friend of mine asked me i mean um he works um, in munich uh, at uh, tropen institute that's the research center at the munich uh, university for uh, tropical diseases stuff like that and um, we are about to start a project of collecting data from 2000 uh, participants so to say they want to create a survey uh, and he asked me if I can help out somehow. And um, I quickly put together a web application on, uh, on Heroku using Clojure, of course. I mean, I can't really say I put it together. It's just like um, you can uh, you have a simple. Yeah, again, please. Somebody said something. Okay, so. Um, I started to create a web application for this survey of about 2,000 people. And uh, that would be probably uh, one of the real usages of, or, or that could be one of the real usages um, of uh, any um, hackathon or stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I've been busy lately with my um, chatbot. Uh, and I still need to refresh my knowledge about web applications and stuff like that. So if everybody or anybody has a um, good uh, experience about it and uh, things like that, yeah, well, it would be, it would be helpful if you, can, if you can help me. I, I think it makes a, a lot of sense to discuss the projects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is the loud noise? Okay, it got better now. I just wanted to say that we have a slot in the agenda that we haven't shared with all of you guys later. So we're planning to discuss projects. Uh, so perhaps we can come back to come back to that. Uh, were there more people who wanted to introduce themselves? Yeah, so, uh, currently... Boss, boss, could you mute yourself? It looks like, yeah. Okay, so a few words from my side. Yeah, I'm originally from Poland, now living in Berlin, Germany. And yeah, closure only in my free time. So a little bit of experience, but yeah, not much. And yeah, data analysis also only slightly, some, some simple things that work, but yeah, not much. So I'm all like curious uh, to look what, what people, what kind of ideas people have. And yeah, maybe to join and, and help if, if that's feasible. So looking forward to what, what we will find out today. Yeah, wonderful. 
So uh, a few of us have presented themselves and uh, we have a couple more minutes for that, if you wish. Uh, I'll just say that in a moment, uh, Dave will give a talk about uh, his work with uh, uh, data and uh, it will hopefully inspire us for the rest of the day. And afterwards, we will kind of see how we split into teams and uh, take on some projects just for a couple of hours. And on the last hour, we will meet again together in video and discuss it again. And uh, as I said earlier, it is just the beginning and we will uh, chat about it through the week and the coming days. Uh, also, this meeting is recorded. We usually record our meetings and put them on YouTube. If anybody prefers not to be recorded, then I can cut the part that you prefer to remove. No problem, please tell me. And so just for a few minutes, uh, is there anybody else who wants to tell about themselves? I know there are some people who didn't tell a little and it would be, be lovely if you could tell something, if you wish. Uh, yes, uh, I think I will go next. Uh, my name is Juliana, I am from Peru, so uh, I don't have so much experience with Clojure. Uh, I just started learning this month and well, that's the reason that I am joining this hackathon. It's because I would like to contribute to some project. And yeah, so uh, I am from South America and uh, the coronavirus has just uh, recently started to spread here. And that's why uh, me and, Ma and Paula uh, tried to build some kind of data visualization in, for our countries. And, and yeah, so that's why I'm here. I would like, I would like to help someone. Wonderful. Thank uh, you. I, would, I would like to go next. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah, so I'm Noor from India. Uh, so me and my friend would be participating in this hackathon. Uh, her name is Ashima. So I have like one year of closure experience and uh, my friend has like a bit of experience in data science. So yeah, we are looking forward for this hackathon to see how we can help with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that's going on. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. So happy to meet finally. And yeah, hi yeah. Daniel. Hello, hello. Mm. Uh, so, uh, anybody wants to say anything before we begin? Hi, hola. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Paula from Peru. I am starting in this programming field in Clojure. I'm learning a bit from the book called Clojure for the Brave and True. And I want to learn more about this current language. And now I am a beginner, but I really want to contribute here in this hackathon. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, anybody? Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, so, hey, hi, everyone. I am Ruben from Indonesia. Um, start learning about closure. So I think I can help with the beginner sections. Yeah, that is great. That would be great. Um, so we are, we are having so many time zones and that, that is, I, I mean, for Tyler, it is the early morning, right? And for you, it is already late evening. And yeah, already 9 p.m. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, I just got up and took a shower, so I'm uh, happy to be here, though. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else? Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Ashima from India, and uh, I'm here with my partner, Noor. So uh, I'm just a beginner. I started learning uh, closure about a month ago. So I would like to start contributing to a few open source projects, which is why I'm excited to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. It is exciting. And 
so I guess everybody, almost everybody have presented themselves, unless anybody, yeah. So thank you so much for this. And uh, so Dave, uh, would you like uh, to talk now? So sure. I'm just going to interrupt quickly. Uh, like we discussed, Daniel, should I uh, do the quick comment about how we propose to work with project and demonstrate that now before Dave starts up? Oh, right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Dave is going to speak shortly, uh, but I'm just going to use this chance to uh, show how I envision we can work together now. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, this is the COVID-19 Zuli prep stream and we'll be coordinating. Hello, uh, most one of the minute, I'll just here. interrupt. Uh, can, can you give me permission to record this? Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, sure. And Thank you. Uh, also, it will be recorded, uh, and we will put it on YouTube unless anybody. Yeah. yeah. You, you, oh, okay. We can, we can send okay. you the YouTube link later. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to show is how I propose we work with projects, and uh, <clears throat> you should all have gotten a link to the uh, master document where we have uh, a large list of projects and a few recommended projects. Um, and the way I propose we work with this so that it's possible to see who's doing what is if I want to work uh, on Dave's project, I go in and edit the project uh, here and say that we have participants that includes theater. And I will also add a link to um, Zulip stream. And I will go into the COVID-19 uh, stream and create a new topic. And I will call it, I'll just start with the project. Uh, and uh, COVID-19 data in REPL. And I'm going to say, I would like to work on this. Then I'm going to find the stream link by just clicking on the, excuse me, the topic link, uh, because the topic uh, is project COVID-19 data in the REPL. And I'm going to copy that link over to the document. So now that I go back out, uh, there's a Sulip stream that I can click on uh, and it loads up and I find the stream. Yeah, so this is what we can do later. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Uh, when we want to work, um, in order to communicate what we're working on. Uh, yeah, good. Um, so before handing it over to Dave, uh, if you have any questions during his talk, uh, you can use the, uh, the topic that I just created. And then uh, I think I'll hand the mic to you. Are you ready, Dave? Yeah, let's go. Um... Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Oh, I'm going to be presenting my screen soon. So uh, if everything, if I cut out or something, I won't be able to see because I'll be on a presentation. If that happens, please ping me on Zulip and I'll hear it. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, sorry, it's going to be a second while I give this whole thing permissions. My apologies. I thought I had permission, but apparently. Okay, I think we're good. Or not. There we go. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can see this. You should see the apply thing. I don't know if you can or not. But I'm going to switch back over so you can give me a thumbs up. Yeah, Theodore? Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Okay. Um, 
Hi folks, I'm Dave Liepman. Uh, I've been uh, a developer for many years. I've been developing in Clojure since 2013, professionally since 2014. Um, and I published this article a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, it seems like a lifetime ago. And um, yeah, we're gonna explore some coronavirus stuff using Clojure. Uh, but first, the, the most important thing is to put out a couple of disclaimers. I want all of us, I want to call on all of us, including myself and all of you, uh, to, to be humble in this. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't think any of you are. Um, I'm not an uh, expert in viruses. Uh, everything I know about statistics was uh, self-taught. Um, and the most that I do for fighting COVID-19 is staying at home and wearing a mask when I go outside and encouraging others to do the same. So what I'm going to do is, is stay in my own wheelhouse which is closure and talk about closure workflow and visualization and, and some interesting, very light data analysis stuff. But we're not actually doing any like fighting coronavirus here. It, 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 that's my impression. Um, and yeah, should, we should all keep that in mind. And all, a lot of people want to help and that's good. But when it comes to visualizations, we have to recognize our limitations. Um, the, the reason, well, I'll get to that. Um, yeah, the reason I started this, uh, I wrote this article and, and started visualizing this stuff is because at the time, close to maybe three weeks ago or something, were not available, right? Uh, so the data was just barely available as of when I started it, and the visualizations had not reached the New York Times, right? Uh, that's very different now. Uh, responsible, extremely well-made, interactive visualizations are, are everywhere. We're drowning in them. Uh, so the need has changed, right? I, I would not share this article uh, in the same way today and say, oh, look, use this to, to understand the data. That, that's being done better by professionals. Um, but to the extent that we want to do this for our own learning, which is still very good and important, um, I think all of us should read these three articles. Uh, th th there's actually a fourth, uh, Our World in Data. I'll send that in the, the Zoom loop, um, make a note to do that. And they're very important to understand uh, the, the limitations of the data and the limitations or the, I should say, the pitfalls, uh, the mistakes that it's easy to make when visualizing data. So for instance, this, this image here of Germany and the cases, this is of, as of two weeks ago or something, um, it's a choropleth of uh, the cases across Germany, uh, German states. The using red is maybe not the, the best choice, right? Because it's a very emotive color. Uh, and this was something that I, I found really useful reading uh, the first article here, Mapping Coronavirus Responsibly. So I really highly recommend anybody doing any sort of visualization, read these three thoroughly. Um, and the other thing is that we have to remember not to trust the data. I'm gonna say that again. Do not trust the data. This article came out, um, a week ago now, more than a week ago, uh, at which time there were a thousand reported cases in the United States, or maybe maybe ten thousand. I think it was a thousand. No, it was, it was a thousand. So a thousand cases across the United States, and then the Department of Health in Ohio said, no, 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 there are a hundred thousand just in Ohio, right? So that's two orders of magnitude, probably three, that the the U.S. data was off, and that's true in a lot of different places. So we have to be data skeptics. Do not trust the data. Because the data is not just the data, right? Uh, the data is signal and noise. It's interference that's lying to us. Um, what we want to know is, is the actual signal, right? We want to know how many people actually have it or how many people have died, but that's not what we get. What we get is this extremely misleading data. Don't just chart that misleading data. You have to get acquainted with um, all, all of the, the stuff that's next to the data. So that means consulting subject matter experts, the people who actually you know, have degrees in this specific branch of this specific kind of epidemiology. Uh, it means getting acquainted with how the data is reported. You can't just take the data from Johns Hopkins or anywhere else and trust it. You have to know Germany is not testing, for instance, uh, people who have died who might have died from the flu. So if the, the, Spain is. So Spain is testing people who died of what might be the flu, what might be coronavirus, and they're seeing how many of those people died of, of coronavirus. If Germany doesn't, 
that's not the same data. It's not apples to apples. So you have to get to know this out of band information about the data that is critically important, um, both for your own understanding and 10 times as much, 100 times as much, if you show this data to anybody else. Uh, so, Dave, I'll yeah, just yeah. stop you for a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, there are some connection problems. And so sometimes it is kind of broken. What we can okay. do is just uh, speak slowly a little bit. So, okay, so sorry. sorry. I'll, I'll slow down. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll slow down. Okay. Um, so, I am going to focus on workflow, uh, the stuff that I know better than the, the epidemiology. So I understand uh, how to work in Clojure. What are the important points for me working in Clojure? I need to have an immediate feedback loop. It's not always possible. Sometimes the, the latency of the making a change and seeing the effects of that change has to grow. But whenever possible, we need to keep it as low as possible or immediate. This means working in a REPL. When you're working in, or when you're visualizing data, it means having the visualization open, making changes to it, seeing those changes immediately. Um, just as an example, uh, when I was writing the article, I ran into some data problems that turned out to be uh, in Vega but I didn't know that. I thought it was in Oz. Oz is the library that Clojure uses to, to talk to Vega. And Oz, temporarily, a system along with Matt Hubert, um, to turn the Clojure data structures into JSON for Vega. And that was good. We were using um, Shadow CLJS, but there was like a, a one second delay, sometimes as long as a, a second and a half, and that's just not okay. And I was very happy to go back to Oz just for the speed of the connection. You have to keep that as fast as possible. Okay, point number two, uh, we want to work in plain closure data structures whenever possible. Um, we don't, I could, I could write these in JavaScript, but then I would have to work with JavaScript data structures and those are just empirically, objectively worse than closure data structures. Um, the big, the big benefit, or one of the, the major benefits of working with Clojure, in Clojure, is having access to the sequence library and the collection library that it provides in the core API. That's just, that's amazing. And if you don't have your data in plain Clojure data structures, then you're you're not able to do these sequence operations on it. You're not able to do these collection operations on it, and you've lost the benefit, a major part of the benefit of working in Clojure at all. So that means that if you, if you do have to interact with um, some sort of R system or Python system, try as much as possible, this is all preference and, and trying to maximize, it's nothing is absolute. Try to push the parts of your system that have to do that to the very edges, right? Produce something in R, maybe, maybe it comes to you in R from the internet or another team. Okay, make a hard barrier, translate it to closure and then work with it and then the translation the interoperation with r is done okay that's the last of my talk and now we're going to do some live coding uh first any any questions they don't have to, the chat has appeared I, I have a question if you don't mind yeah please. Uh, um have you had to handle this is interesting i'm looking at myself through your screen um <laughs> Have you had to handle latency in external libraries in R or Python? And if so, do you use any strategies for minimizing that latency? Do you try to cache responses or something? Thanks. That is not a problem. That is not a problem that I've had, uh, at least recently. I think I, I, I encountered that uh, a couple of years ago with a client project doing some Python stuff, but I, I don't have, uh, I cannot speak fluidly about it right now. Sorry. Thanks. Other questions? Or we will move on. Okay. So um, this is the code base that is related to the article. So the, what I did was I, I did a bunch of work 
in a repository, even before it was public work, uh, and then turned that into an article, and then took the code that made the article and turned it into a repository so that people could follow along. I have been very happy that uh, people across the world, I guess uh, we've, had, we've had it translated into uh, visualization for Korea and South America, and I think there's, there's one more. So that's really cool. Um, the basic architecture is, uh, like I said, based on Oz, which just talks to Vega Light, which is a visualization, a visual grammar. Uh, basically, it just turns it into uh, the things that you would want to visualize if you were working in JavaScript through D3. Um, so we start with a basically very minimal stuff and get to more complex visualizations later. I'm not going to go through the entire article. I think um, someone actually did a live stream of that this morning uh, that I believe they recorded. Um, that would be great. And if anybody wants to go through this in detail later. Uh, what I'd like to do is actually look at a new data source that I picked up last night, I guess. Let's see. Uh, so we, here, we've got um, citypopulation.de. So this is some, some German site. And they have pretty detailed information from individual health ministries. Let's look at the bottom. So it says the, the source of this data is individual state health ministries. Day-to-day uh, um, -day summaries of how many cases there have. It doesn't tell you anything about testing or um, or deaths are recovered and blah, 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 which is also important information. But this is very fine grained information geographically. Excuse me. So uh, I will admit, I, in the spirit of, uh, of describing workflow and refactoring, uh, I initially took the wrong approach. I initially, the first time I, I pulled this data, I actually copy pasted it, which is a valid approach. Uh, and I got pretty far with this approach. I um, and actually, I started to write a live coding explanation. I copy pasted it into a, a TSV file, uh, pulled it through, turned it into a sequence of maps. This was all fantastic. Um, right, you get data like this. Uh, those aren't real keywords, so they'll work, but only, but not reliably, right? Because they're not. Um, they don't follow the closure rule of being real keywords because they start with a number. But uh, so that, that approach worked fine for a while, but it, it's not correct, right? So the, the data it has some problems. You have to do some weird things. I don't want to get into it. But a better approach is the data is on the internet. Everything on the internet you can take for yourself. So I was able to scrape the data using Hickory. Uh, and let's, uh, let's take a look at this. I think this is all pretty evaluated. Okay, good. So it's not worth looking at in detail, but this is a large nested map of vectors and so on of complicated data. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of parsing the, uh, the Hickory data structure, but we get it into, uh, let's clear my, um, clear my REPL and then print that out again. Uh, we translate it again into, one second. There we go. Uh, into a sequence of maps. Um, one of the interesting parts of translating this into a, a sequence of maps is that we, uh, we get that it's a, what, what German state each county belongs to, right? So this is a multi-level, let's return to the data. This is a multi-level uh, data set. But if you look at something like Baden-Baden, Baden-Baden is a city within Baden-Württemberg. What's that? Yeah, Baden-Baden is a city within Baden-Württemberg. But nothing at the row of Baden-Baden tells us that it's a that it's within Baden-Württemberg. So we have to save that data particularly. 
we have to make sure that we don't lose that information. We do it here, we do it at ASOC as we're going through the, uh, the data set. So it's important to do that at ingestion time. Remember, always get all of the data transformation, data massage as much as possible out to the edges of your program and then work with it as needed from a single data structure. So again, we've got this beautiful, useful sequence of maps. That's great. Uh, what do we then do with it? Uh, I think we can ignore the rest of this in space. Um, I don't think we actually don't have to do much else. Yeah, so I've got some uh, a line chart that I have here in a, a rich comment. Rich comments, of course, named, we're not really sure if they're named for rich hickey or because they involve rich amounts of data. I think the, the latter is a better naming system. Um, but yeah, you, I just keep, keep these around with some default settings and all the values that you need to fill in and to-dos so that uh, if I forget to fill them in, it, it breaks immediately. As you can see, I get a nice error that's very useful to me. Uh, let's ignore this data there. And sorry, this here is our pipeline going from a sequence of maps to let's show that data. Sequence of maps on the on the right, and then let's say we want to look at just the ignore all the states, ignore the uh, Germany as a whole, ignore all the cities, right? only look at county level data. Um, let's just make sure that this still works. Okay, good, we still got a plenty of, plenty of entries here. Um, again, we're using this um, delightful idiom where we filter by a composition of first a keyword and then a set of what we want uh, to look at. I find this extremely readable. Um, and then, then we reduce over this <coughs> because what we have is a sequence of maps. Uh, sorry, let's go look at this again. We've got a sequence of maps, but it's not the sequence of maps that Vega wants. What Vega wants every time is a set of data points like um, uh, field name to blah, 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 and then field two, whatever. And it wants just a, a giant sequence of these all the way down. Uh, and if, we're, if what we want to do is look at the county data across, um, across dates, this is not going to cut it because we have data for Okay, this is the 12th of March, this is the 16th of March, this is the 29th of March. The 8th of March, that doesn't help because it's, it, each of those should be a separate data point. That's what Vega wants. Um, and by the way, uh, when, I'm, when I'm actually live coding, um, like for myself, for real, I will often, though not today, uh, I will often put it literally in, in the REPL, in the buffer, a sample piece of data for the input and a sample piece of data for the output, uh, just to have it concrete that I know what I have in mind, I know what I have uh, in hand, and then the function goes in the middle and I, I get it done. So to get it from, well, the, the rule of thumb, whenever you have data in what, like a you know, data in one shape and you want it to be in another shape, um, you probably want to reach for reduce, unless it's a kind of a known problem like a group by. So this reduce, it's okay if this is a bit too complex for, for many of you. Uh, we're one, we wanna take our sequence of maps and make it into another vector of maps. Maybe add a vector here. And what we're going to do is conjoin multiple members of each individual map to our accumulator here. So we go through each map and we say, okay, each one of these 
is going to be uh, each each line of these is going to be added to our uh, as a new data point, and we do some transformation to turn the date from cases three twelve into twenty twenty. Blah blah blah. We save the number of places. And we get uh, sorry the number of cases, and we save the place from the the higher level, right? So we're we're going through one map up here. And then down here, we're going through individual entries, uh, map entries of that map. Um, I don't expect most people, uh, so let me rephrase that. If I were explaining this to myself that way, I would not understand it. I don't understand these things when people, when other people live code in front of me because that's just not how I read code. So uh, I understand most people might not understand that. Maybe you did. That's great. Good for you. I would not. Regardless, we then get the target data structure that we want with a lot of data repetition. But we have a place, the number of cases, and the dates. And I've only noticed just now that these cases are strings, which is ugly and makes me feel bad because it's wrong. But Vega doesn't care. And so it's not going to be a problem. But it does frustrate me. Dave. Yeah. Slower, man. Sorry. Uh, apparently, the audio quality is pretty bad for people outside of Europe, as we're seeing in the little chat off to the side. So if you could just space it out a little bit as you're talking, I know it's, it's hard to keep in mind, but it'll maybe help, it, it'll help them to follow you. Uh, okay. okay. Um, can I ask a quick question? Please. Uh, when you're porting, to make sure I understand, when you're moving this to new maps, like uh, South Korea or uh, South <laughs> America, or whatever, what, um, right. where is most of the work happening when people are porting? Is it in uh, conforming the ingestion of data, uh, making those functions, uh, so like unique data sets? Uh, can conform to the API that you've kind of built here for Oz? Is that where the work is happening, or where is most of the work? Thank you, David. That is an excellent question. Um, let me let me answer it after I just give the payoff to this visualization. Thanks. No, that's okay. Uh, the, the data set immediately becomes a bunch of lines with some missing data. If we were actually working on this right now, then I would try to find out where those missing data points are and deal with them. But that is something that uh, Vega actually does pretty well. And I, I don't want to work with Vega right now while I'm talking to you folks, um, because it's not really important. Uh, but let's, let's talk that about this question. There are two places that are the, the quote important part when we are making the maps. So, sorry, one second. When, just so we all understand what, what David means, I believe, is when we make this map. David, is that correct? Yeah, and then you want yeah. to make a different map now you, with exactly. a different data set, which is the really scary mm -hmm. thing. Right. So there are two places where you have to focus. Um, we will work backwards. Uh, the last thing you do is integrate it with, uh, OK, so it's really three. Uh, the last thing is integrating with Vega, and that's actually very easy because it does not change very much. So this template on the screen stays almost exactly the same uh, when you make something for Korea or South America or you know, Berlin, anywhere. Um, you would change the title. You would change maybe the field names, probably. But other than that, it's just the, the data source. And this data source is actually 
Uh, oh, that's correct. Um, the the interesting part, like you say, is in the um, sourcing the data and then transforming the data. L like I said, let's work backwards. So the values here, the, the data that is producing this map, is a large piece of JSON. Uh, I'm going to evaluate it here. Hopefully, it doesn't break my REPL. It's very large. OK. Maybe you can see. So it's a, a large piece of GeoJSON or TopoJSON, which is a specialized format that Vega understands. It has a features um, vector with, sorry, features vector with individual maps for each place. So this is um, state level maps within the, the vector. You can see for Berlin, Brandenburg, Bremen, etc. And most of this we find uh, online. So I think I I source it. Here. I might have gotten rid of that here. So the first step is just finding finding GeoJSON serves your needs. OK, so it's, yeah, that's just Googling. The interesting part is from some other data source into the correct spot. And that's happening here in this Deutschland GeoJSON with data far. So what I do is I start with the GeoJSON that I downloaded. I name it original, so it never changes. I never overwrite this file. Oh, geez. Sorry. I read that in, and I update only the features vector, because there, the GeoJSON has nothing else. I update, I map over the features, and for each feature, I add in the data from my other data set. So, okay, this is, this is actually interesting. Um, the, the original GeoJSON has the name of the, the German state, the Bundesland, but it has it within a separate properties feature. So under the feature, properties, the name one field, it has the name of the German state, Berlin, Bremen, whatever. This is really annoying because nested properties are difficult or more of a hassle to talk to in Vega. So I move it to the top level of the feature. Same data that was originally in the GeoJSON at the top level now. And then I just put in the, the case data that I have from somewhere else. That is where uh, the other important part of the work comes from. So because you asked, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes, I hope that's OK, on how I get that data. Um, this has changed since I started the project because uh, Nils Grunwald released a library that does CSV parsing the way I like it. When I first released the article, when I first published the article, I said I used closure.data.csv, but Nils Nils Grunwald has very good um, design sense for closure libraries. And this CSV library is, does all the things you want it to do automatically. So before I used this, when I used 
closure data CSV, I had to do all of the, uh, a lot more data massage myself. Uh, what this does, it automatically, well, here I turn off uh, type inference. We don't have to do that. In fact, I don't, I think this is from a version that shouldn't be here, but we give it a, a function to apply to the field names. It just does that as a, um, it could be a, a regular function that does more complicated or whatever, but here we just give it a map. So we get Bundesland, we get a key. We, the CSV has Ansal, we get a keyword. That's great. And then we turn it into the shape we want. I will show you here. This is not, this is not a sequence of maps. This is a giant hash map with hash maps as values. So we have a mapping from German state name, which we normalized. We normalized to a single taxonomy everywhere across the, data, uh, the code base. And all the information we want to know about that German state in one data structure. So oh, that's right. here. Sorry. So the met so the library the CSV library meta CSV brings everything into a sequence of maps, and then for this purpose, we turn that into a single hash map by the normalized name of the state, and then all of the information we want to know about that state. Does that answer your question, David? Uh, it certainly does, and that's much uh, simpler than I expected. That's very cool. Good. <laughs> simpler is good. Um, that's. All I've, it's more than I've had planned. Um, I've been talking for a while. If there are any questions, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, we can move forward. I don't think there's any questions in the chat, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to just ask them right now. Okay, I think we'll move forward then. Uh, thank cool. you, Dave. This was really interesting to hear. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we're soon uh, done with the initial part of the, the meeting. Uh, I'm going to uh, say a few practical pieces of information, uh, and then we're going to have a look at the projects. Uh, so first, uh, if you need help, what do you do? Uh, you can post in the assistance topic on Sulip. Uh, we already have uh, a post by Alan there, so you should be able to, to find it. Um, the ones who are providing assistance uh, in here, could they perhaps introduce themselves and uh, say what topics they provide assistance with? Okay, so I guess it's a bad draft for me to just ask people to, to say that. We have uh, Alan providing uh, assistance uh, and he's not currently uh, in this video chat, but he's monitoring Zulip. So I guess that's fine. Uh, so how should we uh, coordinate work? Uh, I did a small uh, introduction to that before. But essentially, uh, write up that you're working on something in the project documents. And then we, uh, then we take it from there. 
uh, if you need to create Git repos or uh, arrange further video chats within projects, uh, that's fine. Um, for video chats, we have two recommendations. Uh, we already have, have Zoom, which works fine. Another thing that works fine in my experience is Whereby. Uh, Whereby does not require anyone to install anything and it's free for up to four people. So it's simple to get started with. Uh, we also advise uh, groups working on projects to create a project document and link to it from the uh, master project document. So if I want to work on uh, the uh, COVID-19 data in the REPL project, uh, I might create a separate document there to track what I'm doing. Uh, it's possible to do that to let other people know what you've figured out. And when we hold the second hackathon, it would be really interesting to to read what progress people made so that we don't have to start from scratch a second time. Okay, um, that's all the practicalities. Uh, and we'll move on to uh, projects. So I'm going to share the screen now and we're going to have a look at the project documents. Um, And there, I hope you're all able to see the screen. Uh, can anyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So this is the projects document that we linked to earlier. Uh, and in the beginning, you'll find four highlighted projects, uh, which we have written a bit about uh, that might be easy to get started with. and uh, below, there are very many project IDs. And of course, you can work with something that's not listed here, but this is to help people get started. Um, so the first project uh, we've listed up is to explore uh, Dave's uh, article about COVID-19 data in the REPL. Um, would you like to uh, say a few words, Dave, just really briefly about what you envision might be useful and interesting for people who want to contribute uh, here? Sure. So I think I think there are well. So as a total beginner, I think anyone should clone the project and evaluate everything. Make sure it just runs as is. And if you have questions about how it works. Uh, please ask me or Jack. Um, we would be happy to, to explain why we made any of those choices. Um, step two, if you want to, if you're, you're not a, if you, oh, step two would be to do exactly what David asked about, which is um, find geojson of some other country or, or city or place and uh, find a data set that has case information or deaths information or recovered people information or population data or something else for that region and make the two talk to each other and visualize it with a new data set, either for COVID-19 or for something else. Uh, I don't want to restrict people to doing COVID-19 stuff today um, because this is about our own, our own improvement. If there's, if there's, I mean, step three is anything, right? Just totally, totally open. Okay, thank you. Uh, that helps a lot. Um, we've also gotten the tips that uh, Dragon Dirk has released an article. And I was wondering, can I ask you on the fly, John, uh, to tell us a bit about uh, this one? Uh, me? Yeah, I can do that. 
<clears throat> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, I did a quick broadcast uh, this morning uh, just to walk through it. It's um, it's quite nice. It is very uh, gentle kind of introduction uh, into um, <clears throat> the baby steps of closure. So basically, it's uh, you just need a tiny little bit of closure experience. It works with the a copy of the John Hopkins data set. And um, basically, it's, it's ex uh, extracting the information from the CSV files, uh, just using um, a, a very nice uh, uh, library called closure.data.csv. And that converts into a closure data structure. Uh, and then once you've got it into a data structure, then uh, it just walks you through uh, trying to understand what that data looks like. So the first. Uh, first element of that. So it's basically, it creates a list of all the information. All the information is in individual uh, vectors. So in the first vector in the list is the headings and the rest of it is observations. And so it just walks you through some relatively simple closure code just to uh, help you understand the shape of the data, which as, uh, as Dave mentioned is very important. Once you understand the shape of the data, then you can transform it into other shapes and play around with it. And um, so it, it goes on and it does provide some commentary about how good uh, and how not so good some of the data might be as well. So it helps you think uh, in that respect. And also then kind of builds up to understanding like uh, how often um, things are reported in countries as well. And also gets you to plot uh, the information with uh, just using a very simple ASCII plot generator. So there's this Java library you can just include in your closure project. We'll just do some very simple uh, uh, ASCII plots uh, and that will um, display in your REPL. Uh, so it's very easy. You don't need any additional tooling to, uh, to be able to visualize what's actually going on. Uh, so it's nice and simple intro um, and uh, you can just kind of walk through it and follow along. Um, there's a couple of bits where they do change the code a little bit around. Um, so I do I'll sh also share uh, my walkthrough of that as well. Uh, just uh, it's got a little bit more explanation of some of the coding. And that's it. I'll put the links in the docs as well. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I dropped out there. There is a Zoom bug on Linux. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, thank you a lot uh, for, for explaining. Uh, do you have any additions to, if you're a complete beginner, where you should start? Is that just playing with the data and getting it loaded in? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, if you are a complete beginner, then um, I'll, sh I'll share the, uh, the, the repository I have, the, just a closure repository. So you'll just need to install uh, closure CLI tool, uh, just use the depths even project. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can just open it, uh, open a REPL in your editor and just start walking through from top to bottom, evaluating each line of code fairly well, um, describe what each line does and gives you a few alternatives here and there as well. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the presentation. So if that wasn't apparent to anyone, uh, I hadn't uh, gotten to asking John about this uh, before now. So thanks for taking the uh, question on the fly. No problem. Um, so back to the document. Uh, Daniel, uh, look for existing notebooks. We didn't get the time to fill this one out. Uh, would you like to explain a bit? Yeah. So one of the things that we have been doing in, in the last few months is looking at other communities. Yeah, mainly the Python people and the R users and learning from them and trying to import the work to closure workflows. And that teaches us a lot and also allows us to extend the work of others, but do it in closure in the way we love to do. And when we are now entering a new field for many of us, the, the field of COVID-19 data, uh, it is a good idea to learn 
from others who have done some work. And the idea of this project is to just search the web and look for good uh, workflows of people who have studied the data in other languages, in other ecosystems, probably mainly Python and R, and collect some of these. And then afterwards, we can try to translate them to closure. And so as a first step, I would just go and search for good work of others. And I think it would be really valuable to us if anybody wants to do it uh, for a couple of hours during this day. Does it make sense? I think it makes sense. Are there any questions? I'll, I'll add one thing to Daniel's idea. Um, I've done something similar with um, climate data and notebooks because I didn't want to start, I wanted to start from a good source. And um, it's really easy to search notebooks on GitHub and they render in GitHub automatically. So this is a great place to start, especially if you want to mitigate uh, some of your uh, weak points in, for example, statistical analysis or um, epidemiology or something like that, because some you know, people have published expert notebooks on GitHub and they're easy to work with. Thank you. Uh, I think it's really great that we can all contribute to this as we go along. Uh, so thanks to everyone for taking part. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about this point that I called uh, discuss how we best can contribute as a community. Um, I'm struck by this data quality issue because as uh, Dave and others have pointed out, uh, registered cases is likely to be way below actual cases. And um, digging into the data can be really interesting, but I'm also interested in seeing the discussion on what we can do to help here and figure out what the real problems or the, the broader problems are. Uh, so this might turn out to be a bit of a uh, softer discussion and I expect that the format might be dialogue over video chats uh, rather than uh, code produced on GitHub and documented. So if anyone is interested in taking part in such a discussion, uh, then please just add yourself in here as we've pointed out previously. Okay, so that's uh, for uh, projects that we picked out. We picked those out because we have a bunch of project ideas and we can't go through them all. Uh, but I promised earlier that we'd open up a slot uh, for other people to talk about their project ideas. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen sharing now and ask if anyone wants to discuss their project idea. Uh, yes, uh, my project idea would be to, uh, per country, uh, provide some data to uh, the end user to show them uh, what is the predicted um, percentage of the population uh, which uh, is contaminated by the virus. Simply like that. Uh, is that already in the project ideas page? Uh, how can people find it if they want to help you? I would write it down. Okay, perfect. Any other project ideas? I, I wrote a, a bunch, I may start the video. I wrote a bunch of them in the, the existing um, document yesterday. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go over those again now, but I think there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of new data sources. Um, uh, and 
I personally am very interested in any anyone or any uh, work to get some of these data sources that are not accessible to closure so that they are accessible to closure. For instance, there's the, I think somewhere in the Tulip, someone posted uh, some data from Mexico, but it's all in Excel. And of course, anyone using Clojure can use uh, POI or one of the other Excel libraries to, to translate that themselves. But if it, it would be good for anybody to do that so that, and then maybe publish it or maybe just uh, uh, release their uh, their data themselves, so that it's not so that that first step is already done. Uh, another example was the the outbreaks data set, which is in R data files, which I, I would prefer not to have to do the R interop myself. Um, so if someone can can translate that once, and then it's done, and then we can move on. I also put in the idea that um, if we could automate this process. So that, uh, for instance, someone who does not have our expertise could just uh, use a library, call a function, and then our data files are in a beautiful Eden representation, and you can just get to work. That would be very useful for the entire closure community. If I can add to, add to that briefly, um, then many of us know about some data that is local. Uh, for example, in my country, there is some uh, free text data that is released by the Ministry of Health. And that could be analyzed in a way that will give more detailed information compared to the global data sets. So maybe you have some ideas like that about data that you know in your country, in your locality, that could be made in a systematic way, made into a useful data set. Just an idea. OK. I guess we're ready to, to get going um, with the projects uh, that are listed or the projects that aren't listed yet. Um, so that means we'll be closing this Zoom chat soon. Is that right, Daniel? Yes. So I guess, uh, would we maybe talk about uh, splitting into teams and, and then we can stop this video and then meet again in a hour and a half, right? Mm. So uh, would you like to talk about it? Theodore? Uh, yeah, the idea as uh, a project I was talking about, it looks very similar to the project written down by uh, David uh, Schmutter. So I would like to team up with him. So, uh, Daniel, uh, are you proposing that we do a, a short public discussion about who wants to work with who in groups? Uh, on here because yeah yeah okay let's let's do that then how do we want to do that so first of all it is not mandatory to join other teams it is just fine if you wish to work alone and do something and write something write an idea write some draft and then we discuss it uh, afterwards when we meet again in video uh, but maybe some people want to work together so for example, uh, Theodore, you had your suggestion of a project, which is a discussion. So let us see who wants to join that discussion. Could you mention it again, Theodore, so that people can know what it is about? Yeah, so uh, I'm really interested in a kind of soft discussion of uh, about what is important now and what, uh, what the broader response should be, what countries are doing what they should, what countries aren't, what, is we, what we can contribute with. Uh, that's not really code related. Um, and for those who want to take part in that, uh, it's just to follow the process that I'm trying to make clear. Uh, go into the project document and write that you're interested in uh, under the project that you are interested in. And if 
you're interested in a different project that isn't listed, please write that down and write that you're interested there. And then you can, can easily coordinate. Um, link to Solip and uh, then you can begin to coordinate with the other people who are interested on the dedicated Solip topic. Uh, and if you wonder about that, then you can look at the example for, for Dave's COVID data. Nice. So uh, is it clear to everybody how we continue now? We split into teams, we write our names below the projects and, and uh, we meet again in a hour and a half, which is 5 p.m. UTC, okay? And then, you know, we will discuss what we have been doing. Maybe we will discuss some ideas, some thoughts, some experiments, anything that you have been doing would be great to share when we meet again. Does it make sense? Any questions about it? Yeah, that makes sense, Daniel. Thanks a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I'll just announce my project real quick. I'll put it up on the page here in just a second. I've defined a closure library to simulate the uh, SEER model. That's the susceptible, exposed, infected, removed model. So if anybody wants to uh, follow along with me on that, I can create a Zoom uh, channel and we can uh, uh, work on that together. So I'll be announcing that here on the, on the chat. Wonderful. So please follow the Zulip, uh, mainly the announcement to topic, which is the main one where we can follow the main announcements, but also look into the other topics and we'll discuss things there and uh, see you in 90 minutes, I guess. Yeah, so thank you a lot to everyone that's taken part, both as active uh, speakers and as, as listeners. And we'll, we'll see you around later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank guys. you. Hey, Daniel. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi, so, how are you? I'm good. So now we have to choose the project and who we are working with. And yeah. start working on it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. And okay. I guess... Um, so I have to announce it in the channel that we will be working on this? That would be wonderful so that other people can know and maybe join you. And maybe mm -hmm. you would like to have a video meeting with the people who create that uh, project and uh, or maybe you okay. can chat about it and uh, okay. do you have something in mind uh, i was uh, interested in dave's uh, project yeah so because it has basic beginner track in it mm -hmm. maybe we could just uh, down uh, clone it and you know run it in the REPL. wonderful yeah, and maybe visualize it using other countries' data. Mm -hmm. That would um, be great. All right. So I'll just announce it there. And me and Ashima are still looking at the projects list. This is not the finalized one. I just wanted to make sure that we are following the right path. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Hello. Well, I've got something to share. Hello. Oh. This is my uh, vintage uh, bike magazine. Oh, I remember and, those. Uh, yeah. So I got this on eBay, but uh, this is the uh, Lisp edition. See, it's a astronaut there, and it's got Lisp. Mm. Nice. That's the Holy Grail there. Mm. Yeah. What What year is it? This is uh, 79. Oh, 79. Yeah, and uh, there's some, you know, Microsoft advertisements in here that are or Apple mm -hmm. advertisements, so. 
but uh, here's another one. Oh. These are all hand painted. Would you perhaps like to talk a bit, Daniel, about uh, what the purpose of this session is? Because we're going to spend uh, yeah. an hour on video call. Yeah. Right. So we have one hour. And the idea is to share what we have been thinking and trying and experimenting. And what we wish to have is something that will allow us to continue if we wish, you know, not everybody may wish to continue, but some of us are curious about the coming days. And that is the idea to use this hour to create beginnings, maybe beginnings for yourself and maybe for others that may be inspired, but by what you have found or but by some other idea that you have. And we will be there in the coming days and we, we are mostly there at Zulip. And so you have seen the, the COVID-19 stream this day, but there is the data science stream, which is very active and there are many helpful and kind people there that are always helpful if you need anything. So let us try if you wish to, to be there and keep talking. And uh, so I guess, I guess let us begin as uh, most of us are here. And so now the idea is that anybody who may wish to share something is invited to talk. And uh, does anybody want to, to begin? Uh, I can show what I'd like to do and how far away from it I've actually got. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to create a kind of a dashboard. This is going to, um, I'm not sure if it's going to let me share. Let me go to full screen. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah. Uh, is that sharing? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Have you yeah. done that just now, John? <laughs> well, I would like to claim my heart. <laughs> I really would, um, but I haven't. Uh, this is kind of something I was thinking of. I, I kind of found this as I was looking for data. It'd be great to have like a dashboard and see get, you see the cumulative uh, cases uh, going up there and uh, daily confirmed cases as well. You can see uh, it does kind of highlight how there's a big drop off in kind of reporting uh, and then it kind of kicked back in again so you can kind of see how you get some kind of idea about how reliable the data may be uh, and also breaking it down by regions and so on as well so uh, like uh, in certain regions what is it like in that region uh, so this is quite nice this is using arc gis uh, so this is something that the um uh, somebody has paid for in the uk government to do um, unfortunately, I've only got that far, so I've got a fair bit of, uh, of work still to do. That's that's a firm step on the path. But it's it's a start. I've got uh, I've got Oz working, and I've got uh, a, G a a JSON file found for the uh, for England with all the regions and so on. And so now I just need to uh, put that data in and uh, and see how we get from there. But that's that's the kind of. Uh, the goal. So it'd be interesting to see how much uh, out of the box I can get from Oz to kind of get me closer to this kind of visualization as well. Wonderful. Is there anything that you would like to ask people uh, or maybe some kind of help you may be looking for from other people? Um, I think for now I'm okay. Uh, I think it's uh, the source code that uh, Dave created is uh, is relatively easy to follow, at least on the high level. And um, I'm, I'm just kind of copying a lot of the stuff that's done for uh, Germany, for Deutschland. And, um, uh, and that's fairly easy to understand, at least kind of what it's trying to do anyway. 
And so it's, I think it's a matter of just you know, seeing what's the right data sets and then just exposing that, uh, building these bits up, starting with a map and then doing bar charts afterwards and then and then looking at putting it together as a single kind of uh, dashboard of things. Um, so I might have questions later on though. Mm -hmm. And that's Great. it. Yeah, a anybody has any comments maybe to John? Um, me, if you can hear me. Yes. Yep. So with Ravindra, we simply started to clone the repository of that uh, CobID CGL um, this project and uh, simply get it running. Uh, it took us some time. Basically, all the time we were just like fiddling with, um, you know, REPL and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and we found out that simply CIDR check in uh, works. Yeah. That, that, that was the line basically we were missing. Uh, we were trying also to connect from uh, using the CGL um, command line tool from uh, from Cognitech. Yeah, okay, it took us some time. Yeah, not much um, of a result. That's it. But now it's running, it's, it's working, and also I can see the web page. Uh, uh, this uh, beautiful map of uh, COVID cases in Germany by state. Okay, yeah. So now we are so far. Now we can really start to um, do something productive. Good. Wonderful. Okay. I've, and I'll be on the I'll be on the Zulip. You know, the next the coming days and weeks. Uh, okay. If anybody wants to check in, I can't promise a quick response, but I'll, I'll try to help out anybody who wants to work with the, the repository. Um, Steve. Yeah. I have a quick question on, I actually didn't get Cider Jack into work. Where, where did you enter into? Um, so you Cider here. Um, I've, I've been able to get Cider Jack into work from, from any of the source files, but hmm. I, because I haven't run into any trouble, I don't know what the problems could be. I know that yeah. Cider is sometimes not entirely reliable, especially with um, some of the, the versions that aren't super new, especially with Depths Eden projects. This is probably my problem. Yeah. Well, I know I haven't updated uh, Cider and <laughs> it's not broken. No, no. What is this strange editor you're using? <laughs> Yeah, that looks good. So uh, who's uh, IntelliJ are we seeing right now? Oh, sorry, one second. Okay. And in general, so uh, when people are presenting, I would love to see their work. Uh, just share their screen and click around, and even if it's just a code editor with some closure in it, or perhaps some actual results. Okay. I think that would be perfect. Shall I go ahead next? Sure, go ahead, please. So not much of a uh, thing. So we uh, cloned the repo and we were uh, evaluating each of the forms as uh, Dave has said. So by the way, we we're working on the Dave's project, me and my partner, Ashima. Uh, so I'll present my screen. All right. So yeah. So let me start my REPL. Um, yeah. So I load the entire file. All right. And so, so far, we were able to see the visualization of entire Europe. So I don't know what happened, but there are three visualizations that just flash and then they just go away. That, that's a great um, uh, uh, point to bring up. So the, the way yeah, you can see the here. way that this is, yeah, the way this is designed to, uh, to, to work with yeah. is you evaluate it. So maybe you evaluate the whole uh, namespace all at once in the beginning, just to have yeah. all the VARs ready, but then yeah. 
then you go back to each individual uh, Oz slash view command and execute those individually to okay. look at those visualizations. Oh, okay. So it's really a, a, a evaluate as you go process. Okay, so, so if I do it here next, so it should evaluate yeah. me. Exactly, this should be the, the Germany one, right? Yeah, but it says no such namespace or Z. <laughs> That's interesting. If you if you go to the, hmm. I'm not yeah, familiar think, with IntelliJ. Uh, but, uh, I know this uh, IDE. If you go to the top of the file and uh, evaluate the uh, this again? NS expression, okay. and then try again. again. All right. All right. So this should fire up the visualization now. I'm yeah. guessing. Do you have it in the? Can Can you switch to the other? Or to your browser? There you go. Oh, okay. This is German. This is good. Good. Yeah, exactly. And awesome. when you're when you're developing, I recommend uh, uh, making IntelliJ half the screen, or maybe two thirds, and okay. having the browser on the other side, so you can mm -hmm. have both of them there, evaluate something in IntelliJ, and see it immediately. Okay. Inside. The reason okay. thing you could do is uh, to go in the settings of IntelliJ and uh, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe you can make it transparent. No, I, I think I said something wrong. Uh, you can't. Okay, all right. All right, so yeah, so this is, so we could, we found, we searched for India's uh, GeoJSON data. We were able to find it. So we got that and our next step was to visualize India's COVID data. So we couldn't do that today. So probably next time we'll do it by next time. Great. Yeah. And like I said, uh, please, please feel free if you run into any uh, walls and you, you can't move forward. If you're sure. working on this during the week or, or next weekend, uh, let me know, try to ping me on Zulip and, and we can chat about it. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, Ashima, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, actually, I just wanted to thank everyone. This was our first experience and like, we really enjoyed it. We got to learn a lot. And like, I am pretty new to closure, but uh, this was actually, it wasn't very difficult. Like I could understand a lot. So I just wanted to thank everyone here for helping us out. We appreciate having you here. Okay. Thanks for joining. Yeah, that is wonderful to hear. And I, I also want to say that I really like uh, this kind of session where one person shares the screen and the others can help. And the, that person shows something and another one comments. And I think that is something that sh in general we should do more like yeah. you just did because we all learn from it from seeing how another person works yeah. and, and so thanks for sharing that um, um, anybody wants to uh, comment about anything that has been so far no um, so uh, maybe let us see if anybody else wants to share their thoughts or ideas or experiments sure i i, I have an idea um, but um, I, I'm not sure if it's uh, entirely misguided or, or maybe already done. So I would appreciate some feedback. Um, so this is, um, I saw a couple of friends where they were creating an Excel, um, an Excel sheet of, um, of just aligning the 10th case on each country or 100th case or whatever. I, I also seen some charts doing the same just to, to compare how the rates are growing between, uh, between different countries. So I, I try to, to reproduce the same, um, just using also, yeah. um, You're breaking up. Sorry. Um, I got a screen sharing working, but perhaps, perhaps I'll just share this probably. I'm gonna stop the video. Is, is my screen being shared right now? Uh, not yet. Not yet. 
I need to grant access or something. Um, so I'm just gonna paste this link on the in the chat. Yeah. So I, I did this with um with us just playing around yesterday, and it's just like a, a table using the the John Hawkins the data um, of uh, confirmed cases. And then just building a, a, a growth rate for each country, like, like the formula is at, at the bottom, if, if you can see. And then just coloring, um, like the intensity of the color, depending on, on the growth rate, we, we cap, 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 cap in it at 100%, um, which probably should be updated. And also, I, I read this link about not using red, which I, I should update, um, should follow. But um, what I was thinking really, this is half, halfway done, was just both the, getting the chart and the table to align up the date by like days since um, 10 case, I suppose, or, or 100 case or whatever. And then just in the, just, just like to visually compare um, the, the growth rates in different countries. That, that's, that's basically, um, what I was thinking. Cool. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, so I'll sorry, I'll just uh, maybe I'll keep my screen shared with your example. And uh, so, uh, would you like to to keep doing that? Maybe we can try doing that together. Yeah, th that that would be that would be really cool. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen other sources that, that are doing something similar. I've definitely seen the, I believe Financial Times has, uh, has been publishing charts where they align, uh, they've been shared a lot, where they align by 100, 100 case. And my, that's basically it, but using the table and adding like the growth rates. And maybe like uh, an article thing would be to be able to like just select which, um, which countries you want to add to compare and not just like throw every country there, like like interactively. I mean, and also uh, like that may be a question. Some some of you might um, recommend what 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 you would do, use for that. Like uh, like building a uh, like a, a site, basically that that is um like I don't think I could just use us to generate a static site that would allow for certain like um. Uh, interactivity where the user is probably involves using closure script, I suppose, or, or some framework. I, I have no experience in web development with closure. Yeah, I, I'm curious about it too, about what would people use for this kind of task of creating a so-called dashboard with some interactive visualization. And w one option that some of us are trying to learn is the Hanami library, which was written by our friend JSA that you may know. And uh, he was, uh, I think he's not with us today, but he's happy to share his practices. And maybe we will try something together in the coming days uh, as a way to create this kind of interactive visualizations. But uh, yeah, I'm so curious about what m people may say about their practices of creating this kind of uh, stuff. Any comments about it, about thoughts, about how you would go about implementing it? I don't have any thoughts about implementing the dashboard, but I have some questions about the growth, uh, growth rate comparisons. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share it again, yeah. Sure. Um, so there's kind of, uh, I've been thinking similarly myself. I've been wanting to compare growth rates uh, in, in different counties in, in Norway because I think that says something about whether we are taking precautionary measures or not. Um, so I guess, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is whether you could comment on useful applications uh, of the growth rates. Uh, what kind of information can we pull out of this? That is number one. And number two is uh, uncertainty. How sensitive are we to uncertainty 
uh, when we are plotting these growth rates because it's the growth rate of the reported cases, which is not necessarily the growth rates of the real cases. Yeah, that's my long-winded question. Yeah, no, I, 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 I've been thinking about the same, particularly been a, an issue because there's uh, it's probably in the same in our countries, but in Mexico, there's um, this widespread concern that the government is intentionally not um, not doing a, a lot of tests to keep the the the, the numbers low artificially. Um, so so yeah, like th th that that's probably the primary concern with regards to like doing anything with this data for me is that well we're just um, we're just really um, looking at at how fast um, countries are are applying tests really not not actual um, disease propagation. So yeah, I don't really have an answer for that. I, I was thinking maybe adding death rates, not not by not with the denominator being the population. I mean, I, I forget what the proper epidemiological term is. Would would somehow help um, realize if, if that was an issue? But then I'm not. I don't even sure because if if people um, are dying from from um, from respiratory complications and the test is never applied, I don't know how that gets recorded. So, so yeah, like the, maybe the sort, the whole source of data is um, it's not going to be very useful for a lot of countries. Is my concern. And how about how the growth rate could be used? Yeah, I also, I also know exactly. Like clearly, seeing um one country um accelerating their growth rate is is concerning, but I don't know what precise um uses we could derive from that. Thank you. Well, something uh, I was going to mention too, um, you know, in Washington State here in Seattle, they've done about 20,000 tests. I'm um, oh, sorry. Um, and uh, they said 7% have come back positive. So, you know, if you just assume that you're sampling the population at, um, you know, 20,000 is a pretty good sample set. You know, these are people who have some type of symptoms already. You know, they've got a sore throat or they're coughing. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, do you think you could extend that 7% to the entire population of Washington State and say, you know, that's probably a better estimate of the total number of infections than the reported number. Um, and, you know, that's something, I don't know if there's a lot of data for, um, you know, testing. I don't, I don't know if anybody has seen that, but uh, that might be a good resource as well, uh, just to be able to take the, the testing um, results and multiply that by the population to get, the, you know, a more accurate estimate of the total number of infections. Yeah, that's it. Like a rate of, of actual um, testing or sampling per, per country, uh, what you're suggesting, right? Right. Yeah. One of the things you can look at is the uh, one of the data sources that I pasted into the SULIP, uh, the particularly comprehensive one, includes uh, cases, deaths, and testing rate per million. So if you wanted, you could try to correlate those things across countries and see how the uh, rate of testing relates to the rate of cases in each country. Mm -hmm. And if you find that there, uh, if you find that the uh, the number of cases is strongly correlated with the number of tests, you will have verified the thing that you suspect about how this sort of thing works. Another thing to look into is there have been a couple of cruise ships where they've been able to test everybody on the cruise ship, and this is the closest thing we can probably get to a natural rate of infection. Uh, so those would be the two data points I'd recommend if you want to try to find a way to kind of tease out how much you're really seeing of what's happening. There was so also, which data set did you say has the test test rate? Yeah, Jack, any chance you can share your screen and just it's show us? posted into the Zulip. Uh, I will go post it again into the Zulip uh, okay. as the URL, and then I will, I will, uh, it will be there for everyone to see. Is that the Our World in Data one, perhaps? The very one, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Very comprehensive, Relevant and it's a one. good... It's a, it's a good long read too. It's yeah, very thorough, but th thorough as both journalism and data. 
I haven't seen a full, full data on it, but I was also reading a 538 comment um, yesterday that apparently all the NBA players have been tested and, and there's a, a, a very um, high proportion of them who are asymptomatic infected. And so, so um, that's also like sort of like getting a, a random sample of a population and, and testing everyone. I mean, it's not really random, but perhaps for, for this purpose it is, can be mm -hmm. thought of as random. Well, and I'll just say too, I mean, the cruise ship, uh, I have some numbers here that says the infection rate of the cruise ship was 14%, whereas in Wuhan, it, it's more like two or 3%. So, you know, in, in the NBA, maybe they're in locker rooms and it's 5%. So that's just something to keep in mind too, is that the infection rate depends on the culture and the community. Um, so let us think uh, what else would we like to talk about we have one uh, we have half an hour and we will we wish to keep some time for conclusion and thinking how we go forward afterwards but uh, maybe there, there is anybody else who wants to share something or suggest some other idea yes I would like to share my, what we have been doing I don't know yeah, if great I'm going to share my screen and can you see my screen now? Yeah, we, we can see yes. your screen. Yes. Okay, so uh, we have been working. Uh, we are trying to replicate what we do before with South America, but now in with the regions of, uh, of uh, our country, which is Peru, we couldn't find any uh, trusted da data source, so we extracted the data uh, manually. And here is the the data. So uh, uh, at first, we tried to uh, scrap uh, data from from this uh, source, which we found it's more uh, updated and accurate. And but yeah, so time was <laughs> really short, so uh, we we just did this uh, manually. So uh, uh, here is. By uh, the way, this world uh, world meter, I got a good reference. Uh, it looks like this data are better than than the data from I H uh, from J um, H U. So yeah, well, good point. Yeah, it's absolutely good point more to showing us. So uh, that was uh, our first idea, but uh, well, time was short, so we, we couldn't do that. And next thing we try to do is just to replicate the same, but with our, with our country. And now, right now I'm having some uh, trouble with the uh, range of the color. So <laughs> here you see most of our regions are with zero cases, except, except for, for uh, the, the capital, Lima. So yeah, that, that's what, what I wanted to, to show you. So uh, I don't know what do you think and what I can improve here. Uh, I'm just trying to learn how to use the, the colors. So uh, I would like this well, to be more, to show maybe white here. In, well, already, uh, I think we would all say great job. Yeah, this is, this is a lot of progress for the short amount of time we've been, we've been doing this. This is great. And then the second thing is, I, I don't know if you saw it, but pasted into the Zulip, I pasted a gist of code, a closure code to scrape the website you wanted to scrape. Oh. I, uh, I tossed it in there when you and Dave were talking about how this might be a little bit complicated to get done in the time frame. So it's, um, let me scroll back and see if I can't find it here in the... Uh, Zulip is actually kind of terrible because all the little <laughs> channels mean that you can never see anything ever again after you post it, but it's in the channel called Project COVID-19 Data in the REPL is where the link is, and I tagged your name on it. And if you pop there, it's maybe 15 lines of code, and it has everything you need to be able to pull all of the code in that data table down into some closure data structures that you can use in a visualization. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, uh, uh, that's all I have to say. 
So can we fix her um, coloring problem though? It looks like the range just needs to be updated because it's 200, but the range on the data maximum was like eight. So the maximum sure is that... to standard. So uh, oh, okay. I would like this to be white, like when there, oh. there are zero cases. Maybe I need to modify this, but yeah, the, that's what I wanted to show you. And if you have uh, some recommendation or suggestion for, for us, then yeah, you can could us. could we try could we try going back to that range uh, in the in the spec down below? Okay. You know, the, the the Vega spec, where you use blue and purple. So if you give Vega two colors, then those are the minimum and the maximum. If you give it three colors, and it it, it accepts any um, CSS color names, uh, I believe. I think it might, I think it's CSS or either CSS or any hexadecimal. Uh, if you give it three, then it uses that as the end point. So instead of blue, you could try just a string saying white. Okay, right. Uh, yeah. that, that won't work because there's no white in the palette. I would just put it directly in the uh, that, that works, uh, actually. Yeah. How can I do that? that no, that makes sense. What you're doing is right. Just yeah. Three Fs, six Fs. Okay. Uh, maximum, but let's try it. So I would like Y to be the minimum. So uh, is this yeah. right? Yeah, then blue will be the midpoint. It, is this not evaluated? Did you make sure to redefine the map? I'm trying to evaluate. So. Uh, uh, you, yeah, I think you have to make sure that the the applied science palette is evaluated, just like Theodore said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, pardon. Does anyone know offhand a way to evaluate a form without having to select the form first in this uh, editor? Hmm. Well, are there are there any users of this program on this call? So I, I've been using Calva a little bit, and there's a Control Shift P if you try to Calva evaluate top level or something. Uh, there's a first. Okay, search. so can we can we try that? Uh, what do I need to do? So instead of mm -hmm. highlighting the code you want to run, just put your cursor at the end of it. Okay. And then. What is the key combination that you just said? So Theodore? I don't remember the exact key combination. Uh, Juliana, just bear with us now. We're seriously mob, mob programming. <laughs> uh, if you press uh, Control Shift P, you should get a command palette up. Good. Uh, and try writing uh, Calva evaluate in that. And it should fussy search to some kind of thing you want. We want one of those. Okay. Control Alt C E, is that what it says? Okay, it seems to work. Control Alt C E. Good. Yeah, just so you don't have to go and hunt around with the mouse every time you want to reevaluate, which you'll want to do all the time. So okay, this, this that's will, good enough. <laughs> to save you a lot of effort, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, so that should be a good start with the colors. I mean, it'll take some playing around to see why, or playing around with, with the, the spec and also looking at the, the Vega documentation to find out why it's showing the, the, the map as kind of a teal for the zero values, but that's it's definitely doable. Yeah, uh, if I may ask, uh, is it still the case that Lima is the main place where there are confirmed cases and all the other places are seen to be much better now. Yes, Lima is the main source of coronavirus, actually. Mm. Yeah, and there is some hope that it will stay so, that for, for other places uh, there is not so much uh, danger at the moment. Yes, there is not so much danger in other regions right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for this. Um, 
Uh, does anybody else wants to share uh, anything? So uh, I was just looking at that. I can't get my video working for some reason, but um, uh, it got me thinking about the value of maps for communicating in general. And, um, you know, aside from these sort of things like worldometers, et cetera, I've not really seen any good like, government produced or like real authority produced maps. And I feel like they, they could help a lot of people understand the gravity of the situation and how it changes without having to, you know, you propaganda sounding words and that sort of thing. But it feels like there's a there's a gap in the market, I guess, for, for allowing people to generate maps which show, say, the number of ICU beds in a given area versus the number of confirmed cases or, or deaths. So yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen enough like that. What have you find that, that seems useful in existing visualizations and uh, ways that things are communicated. Other good examples to learn from, in your opinion? Uh, so personally, I'm not sure I've seen anything that's mm. um, mm -hmm. uh, adequately like low resolution or high resolution enough that like you know, someone, like I, I feel like the people in my local community should be able to look at something that shows how they feel about the local area. Um, and I don't think I've seen anything which is that granular. Um, the, the, the most sort of interesting thing I think I've seen is the one that um, uh, Metasaurus posted about uh, the, the, the branching of the, the, the genomes. I don't know if, it, if other people saw that, but that was, that was fascinating. Um, but yeah, it showed how the different uh, ph philology, I can't remember the word now, but uh, how, the, how the different viruses have uh, mutated um, mm. over time and space. There's that dashboard I believe someone shared on the on the solid from some some people in Singapore, which is really amazing. This is the, the depth of the data they have. Uh, I believe the this is government published data, but it's it's amazing. Just like the network of infections, it, I, you guys can see it. It's linked on the in the chat, but it's it's so far the, the most incredible thing I've seen. Any chance we can repost that link so that we can ensure that we find it? Yeah, um, uh, I think it's. I think I posted it in the chat. Did you guys see it? It's it's um http um, co dot bit nineteen dot sg. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm sharing the screen for a moment. This one, right? Yeah, it's really interesting at the bottom, yeah, it shows the, uh, the clusters. Like it's got like specific names of, you know, different events that happened where um, people yeah, I was... got infected. Like that's quite interesting. I've not seen something like that before. Yeah, I'm really, I was hoping when I posted this to, to find the original data source instead of relying on theirs, but it's, uh, it's really cool. But I, does anybody, has anybody gone on a search for the, the, the source data that, that they may have used for this? They, they make a point of not releasing it here because I think they want to sell it to other countries. But maybe Singapore releases their data somewhere that I didn't see. I yeah, I, I also, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say. Also, I didn't find it. I also found it odd that they they don't link it on on their side as most people have been doing these days. Well, in general, I was gonna ask, what is the granularity of the data that people have been seeing? Is it just country level? Um, I mean, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of cities have health departments. So um, is there any data that uh, is that granular? Yeah, in, in Mexico, it's, it's, um, it's granular to the state level, though what's been uh, published in like the international dashboards, like the, the John Hopkins data or, or the in world meter, whatever it is, is, is aggregated to, to the country level. 
But yeah, I, I assume as even even for those uh, countries that don't have um, state or city level health health departments, uh, I, I think countries should be publishing um, disaggregated um, data. The U.S. definitely has, for example. Yeah, in the U.S. we have counties here, and a lot of counties do have health departments, and uh, it's pretty granular. There's a lot of counties in the U.S. But uh, I was wondering too. I mean, could you take just the population density of the cities, you know, if a city is 30% of the population of a country, does it have 30% of the cases? And can you can you reduce it in that manner? That'd be an interesting study if, um, if we could find some data for the population density of cities. I would, so from what I've seen from other location-based uh, uh, data, it's extremely heterogeneous across uh, location. So I would not, if I understand what you're saying correctly, I, I would not um, extrapolate that that way. So, so why do you, well, how do you, what do you mean by heterogeneous? I'm saying it's different in different places. So um, the Berlin is surrounded by Brandenburg. The, I mean, it's literally a kilometer away. Uh, but Brandenburg is almost untouched. And Berlin has, you know, 800, 900 cases, or I haven't checked in days. Hmm. And also like Italy, for example, where I believe Lombardy is the region where this has been most widely hit. Uh, I, I don't think it's um, population wise, it's, it's evenly distributed anywhere I've seen. China, I believe it was Hubei or whatever the region has like almost more than half the, the cases. So, so yeah, it doesn't seem like um, it's going to be distributed evenly through populations hmm. from city to city. And I wonder too, I mean, that could be part of the exponential curve of it. Um, because even if you're a few weeks behind, your rate of infection can be much slower. You know, those, for example, Seattle was the epicenter of the outbreak, but LA and New York have already surpassed it because their populations are so much bigger. Um, yeah, you, you're right. That, that that's interesting. Uh, I guess um, when the lockdowns happen, then the, the the regions that were hit first will remain the highest. But it's going to be, I mean, very concerning. But interesting is to there eventually there's going to be countries, maybe mine, Mexico is going to be one where they're not going to do lockdowns and just let it spread through the population as as UK was originally thinking of doing. So so yeah, that, that how that progresses would be would be a, like a way to to um to prove or disprove but what, what if it gets evenly distributed through, through every city yeah um we have 15 minutes now and if there is not anybody who wishes to share another idea then we can use this time to think about how we continue and it feels like we are in a very special situation, right? Where lots of us are willing to actually study these data and we are spread across many places. And so let us try to do something together. And I guess some of the projects we described, we can continue looking into, uh, like probably the dashboard one and the data modeling one and others. and and uh, I guess uh, the plan was to have another meeting on Sunday, not tomorrow, but a week after tomorrow. But since we are already here, then let us ask if people are willing to come to another meeting of this kind, and maybe, maybe there is another day you wish to meet, or maybe we wish to have like topic meetings on, for example, just for everybody who are interested in the dashboard story or in the modeling story. So we may try to be more focused now on next meetings. Um, any thoughts about it, about how we continue? I, uh, I, I wanna, sorry, I wanna continue making myself available for anybody who wants uh, assistance getting the, the code like the article or the repo 
that we that I went over um, running. Uh, so I'll I'll continue to be available on Sulip, um, and if if necessary, I can start up a, a video calls and specifically, but uh, probably going to be mostly asynchronous help from here on out from from me. But I'm very willing to to make sure people can can move forward with this um, their their contributions to the project. I have a question, Dave, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, did you land on a kind of uh, collaboration process? Uh, I saw that there was some discussion of pull requests versus integrating all the code into one. Are, are we, is the goal to try to collect the code, or yeah? I think I think since for me the goal is uh, I have two goals, uh, and I think other people on this project should have both of these same goals. One is uh, to be more familiar with all the tools. Um, yeah. And two is to better understand the data. Um, so it, what it, that means that the product that we create is not super important to me. Um, if I, I think uh, if people want to make PRs, and especially PRs with a um, uh, either a screenshot or a, a downloaded version from Vega uh, that, and put that in the readme, that would be really cool. Um, yeah, but I mean, it doesn't, it's not like, it's not an important app or something. It's just, it is what it is. And we make it a learning experience and all of us come out of it, understanding the data better and being able to make uh, similar visualizations in other contexts. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, this uh, hackathon came up pretty quickly. I mean, I think it was, I mean, I saw it announced early in the week and we started on Saturday, so didn't have a ton of time to prep. So I mean, if people want to meet up on uh, next week, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, I'll probably keep hacking on this a little bit and uh, see if I can come up with anything. and. Definitely will share my progress on the chat channel. Um, but uh, I mean, if people want to meet up uh, late next week, I think that uh, would be pretty fun. Yeah, wonderful. And do, do people have any opinion regarding meeting on Saturday or Sunday or other day? The weekend is the best for me. Yeah, and we can meet yeah. both Saturday and Sunday? Saturday is better. Saturday is better, I see. So maybe we will just have meetings on both Saturday and Sunday next week, because I know about some people who could, could not make it on Saturday. So maybe we can just do both. And whoever may wish to come on that will come on that and the other, the other. And we, we need to think a little if we are capable of doing two meetings so close, so close but maybe we can. I have something to ask. Mm -hmm. um, asking actually the video chat. Uh, it was my relative chiming in. Um, is it possible to do it later? Or I'm absolutely fine getting up, but uh, is there anyone for him this was uh, late this day? Or... Because it's uh, 7 a.m. It's 8 a.m. my time, and it would be 7 a.m. in Seattle, and I don't know how that works for our, our, our friend from Seattle. But anyway, any thoughts there? Yeah, so today the challenge was to make one meeting where people from Seattle and Indonesia and India and Mexico could meet together. And that meant that we had to do this compromise where Seattle people need to come up early. But um, maybe we can split. Maybe we can do two meetings on very different times. That would be um, more practical. Can I weigh in a little bit more? I am absolute. I had forgotten about countries like India, and I'm absolutely. It is not a problem for me to get up at 8 a.m. and I should be getting up at 8 a.m. anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm all for having one meeting, and I will get up at any hour. So maybe keep it the same. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I guess when we start doing meeting on certain topics, then the people on that topic may pick a time that fits their preference we'll, when we will be smaller teams, hopefully. 
Um, I just want to say um, the nice meeting everyone, um, seeing what you guys are working on. Everyone is very interesting and, and thanks for the, for putting to, this together to the organizers. Like it is very, um, it's very helpful to get the uh, project uh, going these days or just keep your mind occupied and hopefully it'll turn out to be helpful for, for other purposes. Yeah, big thanks to, to uh, Daniel and Theodore for organizing this. Uh, and a huge thanks to everyone who participated. This, uh, I think this has been super exciting. Yes, thank you for um, uh, all of the work and putting this together. And I'm very grateful for the organizers and for the other participants. Thank you. Yeah, okay, guys, thank you. Thanks a lot. I learned quite a lot from you. Stay cool, stay healthy. Bye. Okay, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I guess, yeah. hmm, um, so I guess two things that we will ask uh, is that anybody who wishes to keep following up on this may check the stream from time to time. And, and the other thing is feedback, uh, like concrete feedback on how we should do these kind of meetings possibly differently. And we will keep chatting on that, I guess. Um, yeah uh, if we have the time for daniel could we perhaps open for feedback uh here do we have the time uh we have a few minutes yeah okay so just some, some background from there uh I, I stated at least what i saw was my goals for organizing uh this earlier and that was to provide a good space where we could do some meaningful work uh and what's been picking at my mind is how heavy this should be moderated, how much should be coordinated and how much should not be coordinated. So I'm really interested in seeing if you find that the degree of moderation was, uh, was okay or too much or too little uh, or any other questions. I've also posted uh, a stream for this. So if you want to provide written feedback, there's a place for that. But for now, uh, does anyone want to give uh, oral feedback? I'll just say that uh, I thought it worked uh, really well. Um, I like the the introduction by uh, Dave to go over the project that gave us some context and gave us uh, an opportunity to think about, like to focus on what I was actually going to do for the hackathon because I wasn't quite sure in advance. And um, and the walkthrough he did was like very is detailed enough to help me give me confidence that I could actually work with the code base as well. Uh, and then having the review at the end of, and having kind of helpful hints about what you could do. To the code um, afterwards that was really useful there's quite a few things i picked up from what other people were doing as well uh yes yeah, so i think the moderation it was was perfectly fine i think i don't think it was too heavy or too light i think it worked really nicely thanks i felt that we need to share our screens more because every time we did it some magic happened that so i felt Yeah, I would also be interested in, in experimenting with mob programming in more sense, like one person has a REPL and everyone is trying to help and we're trying to do something together. Yeah, plus one on the idea of uh, what you just suggested, which is uh, collab I guess ongoing commentary on on a screen share of someone working and and that's i think uh very beneficial for me uh in terms of using these tools and that's that's my message yeah beautiful um so i guess thank you so much everybody and please be safe and wishing you uh, an easy week and let us keep talking and as much as possible because you know to me it was tremendous i learned so much from you everybody and really thank you so much and um, and see you soon i guess thank you thank you thank you so much everyone
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Stay healthy. Bye. Yeah.